Now, ask most Iranians, and they'll tell you that they want relations restored with the West, including the United States. They were severed after the revolution 34 years ago and stuck behind a wall of mistrust that seems to grow taller every year, mostly over Iran's nuclear program. Iran believes the United States and its allies, including Israel, want regime change, while the West wants total transparency and confidence that Iran's nuclear program is entirely peaceful. Draconian Western sanctions have severely weakened the economy, hitting hardest at ordinary people, not the regime. As with every Iranian election, the question again, will it make a difference in relations with the United States? Thomas Pickering is a leading American diplomat, a former ambassador and senior State Department official. In the face of the dysfunctional official non-relationship between Iran and the U.S., Mr. Pickering has been involved in so-called Track 2 diplomacy, helping to keep communications channels open between the two countries. And he joins me now from Washington. Ambassador, welcome back to the program. Thank you very much. Great to be with you. It's good to, it's good to see you again because really, again, everybody wants to know, do you think this time there is an opportunity? Let's say a Rouhani is elected. Let's just say that happens. How do you see that, uh, uh, you know, affecting relations? I don't want to be disappointing or downbeat at an opportunity, but my sense is that even Rouhani, who is himself a conservative, and very close to Rafsanjani, which is perhaps a reason why he might not win, uh, is not necessarily going to change foreign policy. I have a sense, and I think a number of Iranians have a sense, that that still rests in the hands of the supreme leader. It's been fascinating, however, that this election has had three gates. One, the Guardian Council, which eliminated candidates. Secondly, the public, which will have to choose. And thirdly, the kind of mysterious operation of what happened in 2009. Is there indeed a vote of the Supreme Leader? And is it like Lincoln in his cabinet, only his vote counts? We'll have to wait and see a little later today and tomorrow for those results. So given all of that, and given the very stage-managed nature of this particular election, perhaps more than many in recent years, what do you think the, the, the future will be? Let's just take the nuclear negotiations. And as I said, there's been such a huge wall of mistrust. Is there a way to chip away at that? I think there is. And I think that uh, the nuclear negotiations have seemingly continued despite the fact that there have been interruptions. And in the past, as you know, they kind of broke for a year and then came back for a day and then broke for a year. So I'm reasonably optimistic that process isn't as awful as it used to be. And there is on the table a Western proposal seemingly to get at the 20 percent enriched material, but on the Iranian side, also seemingly not sufficient sanctions relief enough for them. They seem to want it all for a partial step. So can those uh, gaps be bridged? I don't know. But one would hope there will be another negotiating meeting soon after the elections. One would hope that whoever is elected might themselves be a positive influence in the process, even though they're in effect pretty much uh, regulated to the domestic environment and likely to be pretty much a kind of assistant deputy to the supreme leader rather than a, an independent force. I think they had both Hatami and Ahmadinejad who played that role in different ways and seemingly didn't endear themselves to the supreme leader by doing so. So I want to cast your mind back to a session you had here in New York with Iran's current ambassador to the United Nations, Ambassador Mohammad Khazai. You were both on stage, and it was on the record, and we were able to watch it. And I want to play you a bit of a, 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 an excerpt from what the ambassador said when he was responding to what then had been the latest offer of talks that had been issued by Vice President Biden. Right. As long as pressure is on Iran as long as uh, there is a sword on our neck to come for negotiation. This is not negotiation. So therefore, Iranian cannot accept that. As much as the Iran-U.S. negotiation or dialogue or conversation is not a red line for us, the level of enrichment or a stockpiling 20 percent enrichment is not a red line for us, too. It sounded to me very much like there was an, uh, an openness to discuss those levels. How did you take what he said there? I took that as basically a statement that reinforced the declaration of the Supreme Leader to turn down the bilateral talks on the one hand. And secondly, 
what I would call a slightly negative come on, Christiane, if that can really work in diplomacy with respect to 20 percent enrichment. Basically, in one set of words, turning it down, but in the other set, in a kind of tonal uh, inference that maybe it might be workable. Mm -hmm. Give me a flavor uh, of what it's like to engage with the other side. And you have done, not in an official administration capacity, but in so-called track two. What it's like to engage, and I ask you because you know, uh, you know better than I do that over the last 34 years, there have been periodically uh, sort of olive branches extended from each side, from the U.S. side and indeed from the Iranian side. But it's never gone beyond sort of, you know, the ether. There never seems to be any real connection. So when you're in there talking, talking to whatever top level officials on the other side that you do, what is it like? What is the, I mean, what are the grievances? I make two points to you, Christiane. Talking track two means neither of us represent a government, and that changes the nature of the dialogue. And the good news is that we can talk about most things, even if we talk about them as potential or possible or maybes. The really interesting thing is to go back and read Jim Dobbins' book, about his work in the Afghan conference of 2001, where his Iranian opposite number corrected his approach uh, to an Afghan government by saying democracy and democratic ought to be among the requirements of the new government. And where together he and his uh, Iranian opposite number sat down and tried to work out who would be the best person. It turned out to be Karzai, not necessarily a notable success, but not ipso facto a failure, and then they worked together to achieve it. That was quite remarkable, and it is an interesting testament to the fact that even after years of mistrust and misunderstanding, on some things we have been able to work together, like Afghanistan, and that still holds open promise. All right, so finally, after the election is clear and the winner is clear, presumably, what do you think the Obama administration's next move should be? I think the next move ought to be to go and inquire about when the next meeting will take place, whether it is in uh, Amati or someplace else as immaterial, uh, and when and how they can begin to receive from the other side as well as from their side a sense of how we can cross the remaining bridges. The principal one is, of course, what kind of sanctions relief could be agreed for in return limitations on 20 percent enrichment. And the other is the long-standing Iranian desire to have some description of what the end game meet might be like, a much more tricky uh, proposition, but one that hopefully, uh, because it isn't too difficult to describe in the most general terms, that ought to be available in one form or another. Ambassador Pickering, thank you very much indeed. Always good to get your insight. Thank you. Thank you, Christiane, very much. It's a delight to be with you. Thanks so much.